Hello and welcome to the Ministry of Bridges. The Ministry of Bridges is about bridges. My bridges, your bridges. In the previous episode, Andreas von Breiman, Managing Director of Sophistic North America, showed how to connect a Sophistic analytical bridge model with Rhino Grasshopper. Today, Sebastian Lindholm, Advanced Beam Consultant at Trimble, will take that script and connect it with Techless Structures Beam software for a truly constitutable model. My name is Gabriel Neves, and this is the Ministry of Bridges. Brace for another great demonstration provided by Sebastian Lindholm here at your Bridges channel. So Sebastian, I'm going to start by showing our viewers how to access and download uh, the Grasshopper Techless Structures live link uh, and the components inside Grasshopper that connects with Techless Structures. And then uh, I will leave it with you. Uh, so first here at Tecla Warehouse, if you search for Grasshopper, you'll have Grasshopper for Structural Designer, Tecla Campus for Students and Tecla Structures. Here you have explanation of what's going on, uh, what can be done, and then versions, and you can download the correct version for uh, the software you have. You can download that and follow the instructions. After that, when you jump into Rhino and load Grasshopper, you are going to have here the Tecla components. Let's Maximize this. I think it's better to see this way. And you have the component info in every single one. So very similar with the with what you have seen in the previous episode with the Sophistic uh, components, with the Tecla components. It's very, very similar. In this case, you see I have uh, the link connected with my Tecla Structures 2020. So this was a brief uh, introduction of the Tecla uh, components for Grasshopper. And now let's move into Sebastian demo. Thanks Sebastian for being here, uh, much appreciated. Uh, do you mind to introduce yourself and show us and show to the Ministry of Bridges viewers what you have done with Andres script? Sure, hi Gabriel and, and nice to be here. So I'm, I'm Sebastian Lindholm from Trimble, and I work as a consultant and a developer and looking after our engineering customers, making sure that they have the tools they need to, to do their work as a, uh, efficiently as possible. And in that work, I've been pretty heavily involved with, with uh, Grasshopper and Tech Structures, and hence why I'm here in, in this episode as well. So this is a continuation of, of the thing we did with Andres last time, where he showed this grasshopper definition that we have on screen now. And what this does, it, it creates a parametric uh, bridge analysis model and then pushes that into Sophistic. So what we're now gonna try and do is take this same grasshopper definition that we worked with last time and instead create the structural BIM model and push that into the structures. But before we jump into this definition, let's just do a quick grasshopper primer for the ones that perhaps missed last episode or, or haven't come across grasshopper before. So grasshopper is this visual programming interface that you see here on screen. And what we can do here is place these boxes, which are called components. So if I have a multiplication component here, it will require two numbers as input. And then it will produce a result at the other side. And you can see that as we change these numbers, we will get the, the product of them as an output. So these were our input parameters. 
this is a component and this is our result. And perhaps more excitingly, we don't need to deal with this boring data. We can uh, deal with geometry. So let's do a simple bridge deck by creating a sweep. So the component here will take a rail or road line as input and then a section and produce a B ref, which represents the bridge deck. So we can reference in parameters for the road line. And I'm going to pick it here from Rhino. And then I pick some sec uh, a section, which I also have here in Rhino. And you can see we get this B rep uh, bridge as an output. And by the way, by, by default, Grasshopper will always generate its output inside of Rhino. And we'll take a look in a moment at how we can get that into Tecla structures. But before that, we need to align this bridge deck now with the road line. So it's not in the right location. And I can just use another component to replace that input section at the start of the road line here. And then our bridge deck is in the right location. And now we can cap the start and the end to create a solid. And let's bring that into Tecla now. So up here in the ribbon, we have the uh, different components that can create geometry inside of Tecla structures. And they correspond largely to the commands that we have here on the modeling side in Tecla structures as well. So we can create different steel, concrete parts, place components and connections, set all the attributes for, for them, and even extract some information from the Tecla model and reference it back into Grasshopper and Rhino. So for this deck, we'll generate that as a concrete item. Just connect the geometry and we have that deck showing up in Tecla structures. And now because this is set up using these input curves and parameters, we can just change that input and the resulting output geometry will change here in, in real time. And the input we have here, by the way, it, it's now hand-drawn in Rhino, but it could come from anywhere. It could come from a DWG file, for example, or we can interpolate the input data from an Excel sheet or whatever. So you're not just limited to inputs from, from Rhino. So with this in mind, let's switch back now to the example we had last time with Andres. Uh, as Andres explained, this definition is set up so that on the left-hand side, we have all the input uh, parameters and data stuff like the road alignment, the cross section for the bridge deck, different placements, tendons, down here are the piers. And then we have this axis definition component here, which acts like a hub. So it collects all the input data and, and kind of generates the bridge uh, definition. Uh, then we continue with the analysis model. And finally, we have components for pushing that analysis model into Sophistic. So now if we want to create a structural model, we can uh, disregard this analysis part for now and just start with the input parameters here. So we had the road axis. You can see it in green here in Rhino. And I can also visualize it in Tecla structures. Uh, let's see, we're, we're going to pick a construction object. So that would be the line that we have up here. Uh, then we have the cross section, which you can see here. And now we could do the same thing as in the previous example, just create a sweep. But uh, this sophisticated components makes it uh, more simple because in the axis definition, we already kind of have this uh, bridge deck. We just need to use the interpolate solid component. And that will give us the swept bridge deck here. So now we can connect, connect that to a concrete item component and get the bridge deck over in Tecla structures. And we can add some attributes to this uh, bridge deck. We can change the name, the material, 
the finishes. Uh, basically, every attribute that we have in the constructors is available in Grasshopper. For this example, let's just change the class to get something visual that that updates. Uh, and next, let, let's try to create some peers for the deck. So if we look at the Grasshopper definition, we can see that as outputs here, down here, we have the analytical lines or the axis for, for the peers and their rotations. So now what we can do is use, for example, the cluster we have here. Uh, this is a cluster that will create B-Rep geometry representing those peers. And the cluster essentially just means it's, it's a collection of grasshopper components which have been grouped together to make it nice and, and pretty. So we have these input parameters. And as a result, we get this B-Rep model out. So I'm just going to bake it to Rhino so we can take a closer look. You can see they look quite nice. And the same way as we did with the bridge deck, we can get them over to tech by using the concrete item component. And again, that looks nice. But now if we start to think about it, we might have an issue here because these are now what we call items, B reps. So they are essentially just surface geometry, which means they, they aren't intelligent. They don't have any uh, like additional information inside them. So for example, the piles, piles here, they don't know what diameter they have, or the foundation here doesn't know its own thickness and so on. And that means that it, it's very tricky then to, to try and, and document them and report on them. Uh, and they don't work very well with, with a lot of the standard reinforcement components or other detailing components. So what yeah. we would like to do... Yes, yeah, sorry, Gabriel. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, uh, we, we cannot stress uh, enough uh, that situation, uh, that the Grasshopper developers, they need to take into consideration uh this way of modeling for in order to take the advantage of the beam software so uh, avoid items or extrusions uh, at all costs uh, obviously the deck uh, it's a double object needs to be an extrusion but even that peer and uh, with the complexity of the peer if those profiles exist in tecla structures then grasshopper can drive the the those uh, peers and then being placed as columns inside the structures and have all those uh, attributes. Thanks for that, Sebastian. Exactly. Um, so let's actually take a look at how we can recreate this now using more standard tech club components like columns and slabs. So I'm going to go ahead and delete one of those peers. And we go back here to, to the input we had with the uh, center lines. And if I grab now just the first center line here, uh, I can start by creating a column from that center line using a Tecla column component. So that shows up here. You can see it's segmented, it's three pieces. And as Gabriel said, if we have those profiles in Tecla structures, uh, we can use them to create this peer. So here we have predefined a, a varying cross-section profile, which is a rectangular, uh, sorry, a rounded rectangle profile. So we can put that in place here. And let's use Grasshopper to place it on the other pier uh, segments as well. And you can see that even even though it, it looks kind of faceted, that's just because of the display settings I have. So it's it's uh, round in, in reality. And now to get that tapered shape, we can give different profiles to all the three segments and just change the parameters here slightly because it's a very cross-section profile. And then we get that nice tapered shape. Yeah, Sebastian, uh, I think I'm going to use the code that you have uh, here now in display um, for you to give some advice uh, to the viewers for them not to do what usually I do. 
right? So yep. I know a little bit of Grasshopper, not at your level at all. And when I'm going to do something like that, probably I'll copy three times the code. Uh, I'll grab the information from the three uh, and I'll have three profiles um, independent. And that is more code. If we multiply that for hundreds of times, then it will be a heavy script. Uh, do you mind to explain our uh, viewers why we should try to optimize uh, this way of um, uh, doing the Grasshopper script? Yeah, for sure. So just to illustrate Gabriel's point here is that another way of doing this same thing that we just did uh, uh, that is assign different profiles to the different columns is that we could have split this input into three, three different uh, short line segments and then create three different columns one for each segment sorry that's the final one and then we could have three different profile inputs. Like this. And while this works, it means that you now, whenever you want to update something, you have three different places you need to do it in. So I can change the profiles, but what if I now want to change for example, the class of these columns. Well, then I can create a part attribute component. I can set a class. And then I could copy this and add it to the other as well. And you can see that very quickly it gets, gets very messy. So instead, as much as possible, try to keep uh, stuff at, as lists and trees uh, really dive into kind of how Grasshopper handles these different types of, of data structures and try to just keep everything as efficient as possible. So like I did initially, I had all three profiles set in a single uh, input box. And that means that this component will create now all three um, segments, even though they have different profiles, but just using one copy of this component. Maybe that's the point you wanted to make, Gabriel. Yes, yes. And I think for um, the oldest viewers, like uh, in the in the past when you started with CAD, it was uh, exactly uh, similar kind of copy a couple of times to the left side with two meters spacing instead of using array, for instance. Uh, and this is the trick. But once again, uh, I think if the viewers are aware of this, they may find a way to study very well lists and the trees uh, in order then to take advantage uh, from doing this way. Right. And uh, I'm on that stage. Thanks for this, Sebastian. Exactly. So let's continue with the foundation. Uh, we can grab this time we had we had the center line and then we had the points here under the center line. So if we use that point as a basis for a rectangle, we can get the outline of our foundation. And let's feed that rectangle into a slab component from the Tecla link. So now this is a standard slab, standard size, so it's too small as you can see. So we need to enlarge that input rectangle, say to 10 meters minus five to five meter. And then we can set the thickness as well directly as the slab profile that needs to be in millimeter in this case. And we can then vary the thickness to, to what we actually desire. Let's position it underneath the here as well. And finally, let's try to add those uh, files as well. And for that, we can take that same input rectangle and just divide it. So then we get all these points that you see here. 
And now we can take each point and create a line in the normal direction uh, of that uh, slab. And the length can be a parameter, so say between 0.1 to 20 meter. And then we take these input lines and create columns or piles in Tecla structures. So we can see, okay, they point in the wrong direction. So we will need to reverse that direction. I'll just modify this input to the negative. And then we have quite many of them. So we can reduce the count. Something more sensible. And you also see that we need to offset them a bit from the edges. So if we take that input input uh, boundary, we can now place a distance, say between minus five meters and zero. To get something more, more sensible. And finally, let's set a round profile for them. So I'm going to pick the profile catalog component. And this one is directly connected to the profile catalogs we have in Tecla structures. So everything I have available here will be available in Grasshopper. I can go and pick a circular section. And then I can set the diameter here. Let's say 800 millimeter. And it starts to look a lot nicer already. So what we've done now, uh, to, just to recap, is that we recreated this original kind of uh, dumb geometry, surface geometry, with actual extrudable geometry that contains all the attributes that we need here. So I'm now going to disable this for the moment. And let's remove those spears, because I, I already have done the same thing prior to this. And we have it down here. If I go here and enable the block here, this is exactly the same as I just uh, showed you. We're just, just collected all the input parameters here on one side and then added some, some attributes for the different objects in the structures. And this looks a bit thin actually, so we can go to that midsection length parameter and maybe flesh it out a bit. And let's say that that looks nice now. So therefore for the abutments, we're gonna move on to them and I'm just gonna enable this cluster. This is similar to the peers. So we have this cluster that generates the abutment geometry. Let's bake that as well to take a look. Now, in this case, you can see that the geometry is a lot more complicated. So here it maybe doesn't make sense to try and deconstruct it and create it as uh, some kind of wall panels or slabs or, or combination. So I think it's justified to just bring this over as a concrete item in this case. So that's what we've done here. If I enable this uh, section, we see how the abutments come through with the foundation. We have the core bell with the approach slab here as well. And even though this abutment is now an item, the rest are now slabs and beams. So we, we try to bring over again as much as possible as kind of the, the most basic objects that we have and let's now look at the bearings as well so i'm going to enable this section and to explain where we get those bearing points i'm just going to quickly jump back to the input section that we had 
So if we take a, take a look at the input section, you can see that we have named a couple of points here along the edges of the section. So down here we have S3 and S4, and those will be the points where we want to place the, uh, the bearings. And we also have named the locations of the abutments and the piers, which we have here. So together that information, it goes through the access definition component. It comes down to our bearings. And here with this evaluate section, we can pick up, pick out those sections at the abutments and the piers, and then say which points we want to explore, S3 and S4. And those points will now be returned here in the model, as you can see. So four, four sets of points. So that's where we want to place our bearings. So if I just enable this, we have made just some accesses for the bearings, and then we place them here in tech class columns with some attributes. And of course we have the parameters then to control the dimensions of them and, and so on. And, and next we have the finishes. So stuff that goes on the top of the bridge deck in this case. Let me just first enable the input here. Again, you can see we get that central axis definition. And from that, we pick two points uh, along the edges. To, and then we interpolate those points through the sections to get the edge curves. And same thing here with the center point. We can interpolate that to get the center line. So with this input data, we can enable the finishes. And you see that we get here the edge barriers. We'll get the central barrier and some uh, danger posts and so on. Again, with their own attributes, of course, to control. Control what they look like and how they behave. So let's see what else. Yeah, right. We have the ground as well. So I'll just enable the input here. And these are now lines which has come from CAD representing the, the terrain. And if I just uh, like in, interpolate between them to get a bottom surface like this. You can see that we get something here that represents the ground in Tecla structures. And here we're missing an input. I think it's for the bounding box of the abutment. I'll add that one. So we get the sides of, of this terrain as well. So you can see it's kind of a small valley and the abutments cut through here, the sides of, of the valley. And at this point, maybe we should uh, take a look at what happens when we change kind of the main input parameters. So say we have done all this work and now we get a new road alignment. So we want the curvature to be not 500, but rather 300 meters. We can just change that main input parameter. And you can see here how, how all the geometry starts to update accordingly. So we really save a big amount of remodeling by keeping this all parametric. And there the whole bridge deck just changed its position. Let's try maybe a bit more unusual curve here just to show you it's possible. So what we have here is an S-shaped curve. And that works just as well as you can as you can see here. What is interesting here is that the inputs uh, are uh, they came from just a single point. So we don't have the, the designer that is uh, giving the, those key uh, inputs. Uh, doing that for their analysis and design model, and then the beam modeler uh, giving again a set of inputs. So it's one single point of control that 
is going to control the analysis and design and the BIM model. It's a, it's a massive advantage. Yeah, absolutely correct. And for this example, oh yeah, I almost forgot forgot about the tendons. So these come as input curves. Let me enable that one from the analysis model. You can see them here in Rhino. So we can just straight off convert those to, to post stationing cables in Tecla structures. Let me change the representation and take a look at them. So here we can see how they come true. And finally, maybe let's take a quick look at the reinforcement as well. So if I now go ahead and isolate, isolate this bridge deck, uh, right now it, the bridge deck is split up into several pieces that shouldn't matter to be honest, but we can also join it together to one single, single item by changing this input, split input to false which means that our bridge deck will be now one single item. And when, then we can take that item and let's move over here to, to where we have the reinforcement. And enable this section and take a look at what we have here. Uh, before I do that though, I'll just show you how we manually can reinforce this in Tecla so you get some context. So if I show only this bridge deck, I can now go in here and let's say I manually model this deck somehow. Uh, the way I usually would put in reinforcement is to go to the component catalog, look for our bridge reinforcement components. and then trigger them. So if I pick the main bars, you can see here it asks me to pick points for determining the range or, or up first apart and then the points. Let's see if I can grab those points like this. The direction to reinforce and then it will insert some bars for me here. And let's put some more here, some crossbars as well. While you're doing that, uh, I could uh, once again uh, alert our viewers how important it is for the, the Grasshopper uh, developer to have some knowledge of uh, Tecla structures. I think the Grasshopper developer doesn't need to be Tecla structures super user, but needs to understand Tecla structures because then the way the code behaves inside Grasshopper is going to match what usually the user does inside the structures. So, and I think it's very important, uh, that knowledge. Yeah, that, that's a very fair point, especially in this example, because the, the reason I showed you how this works manually in Tech Club is exactly as Gabriel said, we need to know that in order to be able to now try and place this automatically from Grasshopper, which is what we'll do next. So if we look at what we have here, we had that bridge item, so we know what to reinforce. But then again, we have that axis definition and the different curves here along the edges. So we can be able to get points on the sections. So I think we have the points here probably, yeah. So because as you saw, when I placed them, them manually, we need certain points along the edges. So we need to grab them from the grasshopper somehow, which we have done here. And then we can illustrate here with this component, how we can circle through those edge points now, just so we can see that we, we have them now defined inside of grasshopper instead of needing to manually go and pick them in Tecla. So then it becomes just an exercise of finding the right points, mapping them as we see here. 
and then we can construct the input for those reinforcement components that we used earlier. And we're placing those components from Grasshopper using this uh, component. Uh, well, it's called component component, which is rather unfortunate, but hopefully it, it doesn't confuse you too much. We have access here to the component catalog inside of data structures. So we're telling now in this case, uh, Grasshopper to use the crossbars. And then we need to kind of uh, simulate the input that we did manually here from Grasshopper, which is what we're doing here with these components. Let me just enable them. So here we had the input, the input points. Uh, they are at an angle here because this abutment hasn't been updated now to our new road alignment because it's it's uh, baked into Rhino, so don't mind that. But anyway, we're now collecting the bridge deck, the different input points, sending it into this crossbar component. And as we can see, it has now placed crossbar here at the top. And same thing then with the rest of the reinforcement. We'll just add some examples here. And you can see how it starts to reinforce the, the deck. And again, the nice thing is that if I decide to change the road line or need to change the road alignment, all the rebar will also update with the bridge deck and we, uh, according to the new road alignment. Yeah, and maybe here uh, adding that the the grid, so the name or the number that identifies the object inside the structures is not going to change. So any bar bending or bill of quantities or even the drawing, it will be updated. Obviously, a massive change like the one Sebastian now is doing is going to mess up the drawing heavily, but small changes mm -hmm. uh, should be easy. Uh, just to tweak and have the drawing uh, finished in a very fast way. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And you can see the end result here. And you see that all the reinforcement mode, except this one, which I put in manually at the beginning. So that's why you need to define your reinforcement as well through the Grasshopper interface to get the most out of this, this approach. So I think, Gabriel, that's as far as I wanted to go today. Maybe you'll pick this up from here in a future episode. What do you think? Yes, for sure. And uh, I, we are not doing this live. Uh, one of these days, we're going to do something live uh, with uh, with the viewers online, uh, uh, asking questions to Sebastian and things like that. But uh, if we were live, uh, I guess uh, many of the questions will be, can we get that script? Uh, and I can say now that yes, we're going to share this script. It's going to be available at Tecla Warehouse uh, inside the Grasshopper um, Tecla Structures link, and you can download this script uh, that we just prepared. Uh, but just be aware, this example is connected with Sophistic. So if you don't have the license for the components of Sophistic, it will not work. So you need to deconstruct a little bit and uh, get those lines and those sections uh, in Rhino in order then to connect that with the structures. But let's go step by step. So this script is going to be uh, shared. Yeah, and on that note, actually, it's maybe good to, to mention that every input uh, changes we did here, in addition to updating the structural model, of course, it all the time keeps the analytical model and the sophistic input up to date as well. So you, you really get both models updated at the same time just automatically. Yeah, and Sebastian, I can ask you something. Okay, so we have already in uh, key companies, um, very uh, smart people doing Grasshopper in a very advanced level, uh, including connecting Grasshopper with other type of analysis and design. Uh, as far as the analysis and design software reads files, if, if you have any analysis and design software, that is able to input output uh, some fi uh, file formats, uh, then you can connect it with Grasso and you can do this uh, workflow. But for the beginners, uh, is always the big question mark. Where can I learn this? And how long is it going to take uh, 
uh, to learn, uh, so the learning curve, in order to start doing something like that? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, while it is possible to learn on your own, uh, I have done it and many others, it does require some time and effort, at least initially. So the learning curve for, for something like Grasshopper, if you're not used to visual programming, can be quite steep, but you don't need to be a programmer or anything like it. You just need to have kind of an, a curiosity and, and an engineering mind and, and then you'll be just fine. So there are very good tutorials online that you can start with on, on the Grasshopper and Rhino homepages. But then if you really want to boost this, I would suggest that that you look up some local Rhino reseller. Many of them offer Grasshopper and Rhino trainings and just go on a, you know, one, two, three days training. I don't know how long they, they last, but but that means that you can get kind of a kickstart and, and you get all those small very time saving details that you perhaps wouldn't learn otherwise until far later. So I know I, I personally would probably have benefited a lot by, by taking a proper grasshopper course at some point. Yeah, that is a good uh, hint or tip there. Uh, and I, I can add that the forums for the Rhino grasshopper are very, very active. Just be prepared to search before you ask. So uh, everyone is very busy. So save some time, search before you ask. And uh, I guess even Sebastian, uh, you use the forums, right? Yeah, from time to time I'll go and check and they, they are very yeah, good, as you say, Gabriel. All right, so I think uh, last thing is to say thank you very much, Sebastian, for being here. It was a fantastic uh, demo. Uh, the script is going to be available. Thanks for being here. Um, and hopefully you will be back to to show other kind of scripts. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Gabriel. Looking forward to it. I have told you, this was going to be great. Does Sebastian deserves a like? I guess so. Leave as many questions as you want down on the comments box. Sebastian will answer those on a future episode. It is time to say goodbye for today. See you on the next episode and have a brimmer day.